The next item of business is Stage 3 Proceedings on the Damages, Investment, Returns and Periodical Payments Scotland Bill. In dealing with the amendments, members should have. The bill is amended at Stage 2, that is SP Bill 35A, the marshalled list and the groupings of amendments. The division bell will sound. The proceedings will be suspended for five minutes for the first division of the afternoon. The period of voting for the first division will be 30 seconds. Thereafter, I will allow a voting period of one minute for the first division after a debate. Members who wish to speak in the debate in any group of amendments should press the request to speak buttons as soon as possible after I call the group. Members should now refer to the marshalled list of amendments. And I call in group one, periodical payments, pursuers' wishes, amendment one in the name of Jackie Bailey in a group of his own. And I would ask Jackie Bailey to move in to speak to amendment one. Ms Bailey, please. Thank you very much, presiding officer. I'm pleased to speak to amendment one in the group. Um, uh, and certainly in group one of the damages, investment returns and periodical payment Scotland bill. That is indeed a mouthful. Um, but this amendment reflects an area considered by the committee during the scrutiny of the bill and on which they made a recommendation for change to the Scottish Government. I brought forward an amendment at stage two, which I was asked to withdraw by the Minister to allow for further discussion. That discussion has resulted in the amendment before the Chamber today. In essence, this amendment will require the court to have special regard, not just to a pursuer's needs, but also to their preferences. For many pursuers, this will have been a lengthy process trying to obtain recompense for personal injury, which, which may well have been severe and catastrophic. It is essential in my view that their voice is heard throughout the process. So this amendment is designed to ensure that at the very final stage of the process, a pursuer's views will have been listened to and given full consideration by the judge. Their preference as to whether to have a lump sum or indeed a periodic payment must be a principal factor at the forefront of the court's mind. Now, the language of the amendment is careful to avoid creating a presumption as it doesn't give the pursuer the right of veto. But I would be very surprised if it isn't a key factor in a judge's decision. I would certainly expect that the requirement placed on the court to treat the pursuer's preference as well as their needs as a principal factor will have a real impact on the court's decision-making process in every case. So I am grateful to the Minister for her officials for working with me to give effect to the committee's recommendation. So I move the amendment in my name. Thank you. I call Liam MacArthur to be followed by John Mason. Mr MacArthur. Yeah. Thank you very much, Deputy President Officer, and I'm very grateful to Jackie Bailey for setting out very clearly the, the, the background to this uh, amendment. Obviously, I have not sat through the evidence the, the committee sat through, but uh, the Justice Committee did deal with the Civil Litigation Bill earlier in this Parliament, uh, which touched on many of the same uh, issues. And I think one of the uh, things that we wrestled with in terms of um, often very significant payments were that um, uh, individuals could potentially come under pressure from members of their family or indeed um, wider friend group um, to opt for a large lump sum uh, which then may not necessarily be invested in uh, their best interest. There was also the issue that with a lump sum as opposed to a periodic payment, uh, the pursuer would also be liable um, to a legal fee uh, to their solicitors over and above uh, the normal cost as well. So while um, I think it's very helpful the way that Jackie Bailey has set out the rationale for the approach, and I think nobody would wish to see the pursuer's interests uh, ridden roughshod over, um, I suppose uh, for myself and perhaps other Justice Committee colleagues who wrestled with this under a different piece of, of legislation, it would be helpful either for Jackie Bailey or indeed the Minister to, to clarify how those safeguards uh, can play in to avoid those sorts of, uh, um, uh, I think, issues passing that are clearly not in the interest of the individual concern. Thank you. John Mason. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, yes, I would happy to support this uh, amendment that Jackie Bailey has proposed. I think on the committee, many of us did feel that a move towards more periodical payment orders would be a good idea. And looking in from the outside, that often is a good answer because it takes away the risk and having to decide about investments and many of these things which many people are not comfortable with. But I think the point on the other hand was made that uh, some people uh, did not perhaps trust uh, the defendant uh, to actually keep on paying the money and some of them just wanted to break the relationship uh, with the defender uh, and to have a, a standalone amount. So I think it's fair to say that the courts, the courts maybe would have considered all of this anyway, but I think it does no harm to re-emphasise uh, that the courts should take into account uh, what the pursuer is looking for. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. 
Um, it was very helpful to meet with uh, Jackie Bailey to discuss the amendments that she lodged at Stage 2. And the Stage 2 amendment was attended to allow the pursuer's voice to be heard in respect of their preference for either a periodical payment or for a lump sum. Jackie Bailey and other members have spoken about trying to address that sense of powerlessness that people who have suffered a catastrophic injury might well feel should an order for periodical payments be imposed. And that is a very difficult thing to capture, but that doesn't mean that it can't be done. Um, I think we had a very productive discussion since stage two, and we've come away with a better understanding of one another's position on the issue. And I did always indicate that I had some sympathy with the underlying principle behind the stage two amendment. But my concerns lay uh, in the way that the stage two amendment was being given, given effect, which I believe went too far and also had the potential to create some legal difficulties. It's an important for balance to be struck in highlighting the pursuer's preferences as a key consideration, but without treating the pursuer's position as paramount, without creating an overly rigid presumption or giving the pursuer a unilateral veto or allowing the defender to be put at a substantial disadvantage compared to the pursuer and putting at risk, therefore, the defender's right to a fair hearing. I'm very pleased to say that I don't have any difficulties along these lines with Amendment 1 being debated today. Amendment 1 refers not just to a pursuer's needs, but also to the pursuer's preferences. And I think this addresses the very human aspect of a pursuer's position about which a number of members have spoken. But Amendment 1 goes beyond ensuring simply that the court takes into account the views of the pursuer, as it could do anyway. The amendment expressly highlights the needs and preferences of the pursuer as something for the court to have special regard to. From the particular language used, it may be expected that the things highlighted will weigh heavily as key considerations at the forefront of the court's mind when it's deciding between the options for the form of the award. Indeed, all things being equal, it may be expected that the pursuer's needs and preferences will be given priority by the court. In summary, I believe that Amendment 1 strikes the appropriate balance while ensuring the pursuer's preferences as well as needs are specifically recognised in the bill and accordingly I am happy to support Amendment 1. Thank you, Jackie Bailey. To wind up and press or withdraw your amendment. Briefly, um, Presiding Officer, can I welcome the contribution from the Minister and indeed other members across the Chamber. Um, it wasn't just I that uh, raised this at the Stage 1 debate. My colleague Angela Constance did likewise, um, and this is something that the Committee considered to be important. John Mason was right to reference um, the use of periodic payment orders as a mechanism to reduce risk and ensure that awards are made over the lifetime of a pursuer. Um, the reality, I think, is that we will see a combination of lump sums and periodic payments um, in play. But ultimately, and let, let me reassure um, Liam MacArthur in particular, we wanted at the end of a very long, lengthy court process for the pursuer's voice to be heard um, and to ensure that ultimately um, it wasn't just about their needs that were being met, but that their preferences were taken into consideration too. And I'm sure the court would be alive to some of the external pressures that pursuers may face. But I would ask the chamber to support this amendment um, because, presiding officer, it's the right thing to do. Just simply say press or withdraw. Are you pressing your amendment? I'm I pressing, <laughs> presiding officer. So. Uh, the question is, amendment one be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Group two, periodic payments, drafting amendments. I call amendment two in the name of the minister. Group with amendments three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. Minister, please to move amendment two and speak to the other amendments in the group. All of these amendments fall into the category of minor and tidying in nature. Amendments two, four, and five relate to an amendment moved by Stuart Stevenson and agreed to by the committee at stage two to place a requirement on the court to set out its reasons for being satisfied that the continuity of payments is reasonably secure. At the time, I reserved the possibility of bringing forward government amendments to make any necessary technical changes at stage three so as to ensure that the wording of the provision added by Stuart Stevenson fully dovetails with the related provisions. These amendments, therefore, make some minor adjustments to the text in order to do so, and I think they speak for themselves. The substance of Stuart Stevenson's addition at stage two is not affected. 
Amendments 3, 6, 7 and 8 come about as a result of suggested change made by the Association of British Insurers. The ABI expressed the view that in the new subsection 1A, in section 3.1c, the reference to a court not making an order for periodical payments unless it is satisfied that the continuity of payment under such an order would be reasonably secure should be changed to is reasonably secure. And as well as making the wording chime more tightly with the introduction of the assumptions which follow in the new 2c one, the section would bring the drafting more in line with the equivalent provision which applies in England and Wales. Importantly, the conditional element of the matter is not lost altogether, as the new section 2C1 continues to refer as necessary to what would be the case. Whilst we are satisfied that no difference could arise in practice under the wording used, we are content to make the change. The same point arises elsewhere in section three and once in section four, so similar changes are made for consistency in those places too, and I move amendment two in my name. Uh, thank you. No other members indicated the wish to speak. Minister, do you wish to wind up? No, thank you. The not. question is amendment two be agreed to. Are we all agreed? I now call amendments three, four, five, six, seven, eight, seven and eight, all in the minister and all previously debated. I invite the minister to move the amendments three to eight on block. Moved, presiding officer. Does any member object to a single question we put on amendments three to eight? Thank you. Uh, <laughs> the question is amendments three to eight are agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. Group 3, Rate of Return Standard Adjustments. I call Amendment 9 in the name of Minister and a group in its own Minister to move and speak to Amendment 9, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. So I explained at Stage 2 that the approach taken in the Bill on how the discount rate should be calculated is based on a portfolio which meets the needs of the hypothetical investor as described in the Bill. The asset classes and percentage holdings contained in the notional portfolio have been balanced in such a way as to support an approach in terms of investment choices which is capable of limiting volatility and uncertainty. The bill also includes two standard adjustments which the rate assessor must deduct when arriving at the rate of the return and the amendment deals with the first of these. It is intended to take account of investment advice, management costs and taxation and the adjustment is set out on the face of the bill with regulation making powers for Scottish ministers to change the adjustment if required. The Scottish Government accepts that there will be a need to take investment advice and indeed one of the characteristics of the hypothetical investor is that they are properly advised. Prior to the introduction of the bill, Scottish ministers sought views from the Government Actuaries Department on the appropriate level for the adjustment for tax and passive investment management costs. Whilst GAD considered that the reasonable allowance for expenses and tax might fall into the range of 0.5 to 2%, they were also of the view that an allowance at the lower end is likely to be more appropriate because it's reasonable to assume that pursuers will shop around for competitive fees, it's reasonable to assume that pursuers will directly invest in passive funds, and in the current economic environment, income yields particularly on bonds, are low, which eases the possible pressure of higher tax charges, and also that there are further prudence dedu deductions included elsewhere in the discount rate. At stage two, Jackie Bailey brought forward an amendment which sought to increase the standard adjustment for tax investment management costs from 0.5% to 1.5%. I pointed out that the composition of the portfolio and the level of adjustments which are set out in the bill are the result of analysis, actuarial advice, and available evidence. The methodology and adjustments have been carefully calibrated with a view to ensuring, insofar as possible, the principle of 100% compensation is adhered to, and they are a complete package of measures with the further adjustment ensuring that the possibility of undercompensation is at an acceptable level. I was also clear that from the government's point of view that Jackie Bailey's proposed increase would tip the balance too far in favour of pursuers. Too high a percentage for the deduction under consideration would increase significantly the chances of pursuers being overcompensated. And this would go against the principle of achieving the right levels of compensation and pass an undue burden onto defenders, including public services such as the NHS. During stage two, Jackie Bailey withdrew her amendment 
on the basis that we would have opportunity to discuss the issue further. And it was helpful to meet with Jackie Bailey and to exchange our views after stage two. I was able to advise that we would be working with the Ministry of Justice to get early access to any relevant evidence on tax and investment management costs arising from their very recent call for evidence ahead of the review in England and Wales, and we have done that. With that information to hand, we sought further advice from um, the Government Actuaries Department. I have now considered their advice, which points to a small uplift in the adjustment being required. Their advice is given in the context of the portfolio contained in the bill. Their view is that there have been small increases in the fees which would apply. Specifically, in GAD's view, there is a small increase in appropriate passive fund manager fees, reflecting evidence from the call and further consideration of the charges that might apply for the Scottish portfolio. And based on the evidence from the call, it would be appropriate to include a small allowance for charges for platform fees in order to access the funds and for also obtaining advice. My amendments will therefore increase the standard adjustment from 0.5% to 0.75% to allow for these increases. I'm content that this is the appropriate change to make based on this impartial and professional advice, and indeed that not to make it would be to ignore that advice. This change will help ensure that, as far as possible, pursuers are properly compensated through the application of the discount rate arrived at through the application of the new methodology. The percentage in my amendment represents an important aspect of getting this right. And, presiding officer, I move Amendment 9. Thank you very much. I call Dean Lockhart, followed by Jackie Bailey. Mr Lockhart. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Amendment 9, as we've heard in the name of the Minister, would increase the standard adjustment to the discount rate for, for investment charges and taxation to 0.75% from 0.5% as originally set out in the Bill. The Economy Committee's Stage 1 report on the Bill considered this adjustment to the discount rate. And after considering evidence from all sides of the argument, the Committee concluded that, on balance, it was content with an adjustment rate being set at 0.5%. At stage two, the Minister told the committee that a 0.5% standard adjustment recognised that investors would shop around to get the best possible rate for investment charges and that the notional investment portfolio would largely comprise passive funds which would not require active management and would not incur significant investment charges. The Minister also told the committee, as she set out in her opening, that she accepted the advice from the Government Actuaries Department on the adjustment level being set around 0.5%. Given this background, increasing the standard adjustment to 0.75% runs the real risk of departing from the fundamental principle under Scots law of fair compensation. While we do understand the government's approach of uh, legislating in favour of overcompensation rather than risking undercompensation, we do have to recognise that this comes at a cost. The costs associated I will in a second. The costs associated with paying more than 100% compensation will fall on public bodies in Scotland, such as the NHS and other public bodies that self-insure. I'll give way to John Mason. John Mason. Yeah, I thank the member very much for giving way. I mean, would you accept that it is not possible to get to a position where everyone is correctly 100% compensated, but it is inevitable that some will be undercompensated and some will be over? Dean Lockhart. Uh, thank you. That, that's a fair comment, and, and I think you have to be somewhere in the spectrum, but I think, based on the evidence we heard at committee, this uh, increase of the uh, adjustment to 0.75% takes us quite far down the spectrum of the risk of overcompensation. Uh, and, as I said earlier, the, the, the reality is that uh, the cost of paying more than 100% compensation will, uh, in real life, fall on uh, public bodies in Scotland. And, presiding officer, for the reasons I've set out above, uh, the Scottish Conservatives will not be in a position to support Amendment 9 in the name of the Minister. I call Jack Bailey, followed by Liam MacArthur. Presiding officer, I welcome the opportunity to speak in the debate on Amendment 9 in the name of the Minister. The Committee took evidence at Stage 1 about standard adjustments, and as the Minister has referenced, I brought forward an amendment at Stage 2 specifically about the amount allowed for the impact of taxation and the cost of investment advice. The Scottish Government's position, as we've heard, was to allow for 0.5%, 
which was considered by some to be just too low and not reflect the actual cost of advice and taxation. The Association of Personal Injury Lawyers provided expert evidence from a range of independent financial advisors, all experienced in this area, that all suggested that 0.5% was too low and the real costs were likely to be between 1.5 and 2% based on their experience of dealing with personal injury cases. My amendment was du duly cautious at setting the rate at 1.5%. Um, and indeed, if I might pray and aid the Government Actuaries Department, they published their own analysis of the personal injury discount rate and the Minister rightly suggested um, that their advice for tax liability and fees for advice was likely to be anywhere in the range of 0.5 to 2%. Um, the Minister and the Scottish Government chose obviously to place the rate at the lowest end of the scale but I might also point out that the Actuary Department also said that it would be appropriate for the rate to be set higher. As the Minister has referenced, um, there is a review south of the border by the Ministry of Justice, and she has helpfully considered this in her further deliberations. Again, I welcome the very helpful discussion with the Minister and her officials. They have reflected further and adjusted the rate upwards to 0.75%. Now, it's not as much as I would have liked, it's not as much as the evidence suggests we may require, but I recognise that it is a step in the right direction. I will therefore be supporting the amendment, but I would ask the Minister to assure the Chamber that she and her officials will keep this under review and change the rate in the light of experience to avoid any suggestion of undercompensation. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Liam MacArthur to be followed by Daniel Johnson. Uh, Thank you very much, Deputy President. Uh, I, again, I'm conscious that I don't have the background on this bill that uh, both Dean Lockhart and Jackie Bailey do, uh, and indeed the Minister. I was, I, I, I think, reassured to some extent by what the Minister had to say uh, about her engagement with the Government's actuarial um, department, uh, and clearly there is a balance to be um, struck here. I think the committee itself um, came to the conclusion there is not an exact uh, science here. I, but I'm struck by the response that the Minister gave to my colleague Alex Cole Hamilton in a written uh, answer to a parliamentary question um, very recently, where he said that the Scottish Government expects that the UK Government will continue to cover the costs arising from the change in the discount rate to the extent that the rate in Scotland is in line with the rate in England and Wales. The Scottish Government will continue to pass this funding on to the NHS in Scotland, which is um, I think very helpful, but does I think rest very heavily on um, the, the fact that the rate in Scotland is in line with that in England and Wales, and as I understand it, that may not be the, the, uh, the case in this instance, and therefore I, I wonder how that shortfall will be met, whether the Minister has had discussions uh, not just with the actu actuarial department, uh, but with health colleagues about the potential implications uh, for any financial liability to the NHS. <laughs> Uh, and whether or not um, uh, there will be a revised financial memorandum published. I, as I understand it, I don't think there is one ahead of stage three, which is rather unhelpful uh, for those of us uh, who are trying to get our heads around what the implications are uh, of the change that ministers propose. Thank you. Daniel Johnson. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'd very much like to reflect the comments uh, made by Jackie Bailey. This was a point of some debate and discussion at stage one, and rightly so. What we're talking about here is the money ava made available to people in order to get their affairs in order, having been awarded compensation. And while much of the talk is of what might be reasonable or what typically people might be able to obtain, we must also look at the, the people that fall outside the range of reasonable expectations and very much in line with Jordan Mason was pointing out that some people may well be overcompensated and some people may be undercompensated. He's right. But what we need to do is ensure that we protect the most vulnerable because these are undoubtedly vulnerable people we're talking about. And I do note that the range of uh, 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 values that were arrived at by the Government Actuary were 0.5 to 2 per cent. And indeed, while they might have said it, that the appropriate rate would be the lower range, 0.75 per cent is well within that lower range. So I too, like Jackie Bailey, would like uh, to, to hear from the Minister how this rate will be kept under review and also how, if it's found to be insufficient, uh, it might be revised in the future. But in the end, the, the, the increase is welcome, albeit uh, maybe not quite as uh, going as far as we might like on these benches. Um, so thank you. Minister, please, to wind up. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. There's a number of points that I'd like to address in my summing up now. Um, firstly, uh, this is a point raised by Dean Lockhart. Um, the new rate, when it comes in in September, I expect to save defenders money. And defenders would, of course, include the NHS in that. Uh, the call for evidence by the MOJ on matters relating to investments was extremely timely in this case. And my amendment is based on that most recent evidence. Uh, GAD analysed the evidence from that call for evidence by the MOJ um, with reference to the portfolio in the bill that we are discussing and they revised their advice. Um, it would not be appropriate then um, not to act on that advice that I had been given. I want the adjustment in this bill to reflect the most up-to-date evidence available and that is what it does. Of course, the adjustments will be kept under review um, and that is on the face of the bill as well, just to reassure Daniel Johnson on that point. Press and withdraw, Minister. Press. Thank you. The question is, Amendment 9 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. Uh, there will be division as this is the first division of the stage. The Parliament is suspended for five minutes.
Thank you. We will now proceed with the division on Amendment 9. This is a 30-second division, so members should cast their votes now. Thank you. The result of vote in Amendment 9 is yes, 84. There no, there were no votes for no and abstentions 26. That amendment is therefore agreed. We now call on Group 4, rate of return drafting amendments. I call Amendment 10 in the name of the Minister. Group with Amendments 11, 12, 13 and 14. Minister, uh, please, I'm trying to say something and I can't even hear myself. Thank you. Minister, to move Amendment 10 and speak to all amendments in the group, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. All the amendments in this group relate to an amendment moved by Dean Lockhart at Stage 2 and agreed by the Committee. The amendment reworked the duty of the Scottish Ministers in relation to the notional portfolio. The duty went from having regard uh, to the need to ensure the notional portfolio remains suitable for the hypothetical investor to including a review on suitability, incorporating a requirement to consult appropriate persons. At the time, I reserved the possibility of bringing forward government amendments to make any necessary drafting changes at stage three, not only to ensure that the provisions would work properly, given the possibility of an interim rate review, but also to ensure that the overall wording and structure of the provisions reach the desired result in the best and in the clearest way possible. Amendments 10, 11, 12 and 14 make some modest adjustments to the text in connection with the review of the portfolio. They align the wording of the text with the provisions cross reference to they reflect the fact that the ongoing assessment of the portfolio and the making of regulations, if necessary, are really just parts of a single process. They directly tie the necessity of regulation making to the suitability of the portfolio for the notional investor. And they tidy the structure and the wording of the provisions and give a useful signpost for the reader to the description of the notional investor. However, the substance of what Dean Lockhart added at stage two is not affected by these amendments. They preserve the need to assess the notional portfolio ahead of each five-year cycle of review, along with a duty to consider whether regulations are necessary. Amendment 13 is different. Interim reviews, by their very nature, are likely to be needed where there are urgent or extraordinary circumstances. And Amendment 13, therefore, excludes interim reviews from the scope of the provisions added by Dean Lockhart at stage two. Presiding officer, I move amendment 10 in my name. Thank you, Minister. No other members indicated they wish to speak. Do you wish to wind up? The question is amendment 10 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? I call amendments 11, 12, 13 and 14 all in the name of the Minister and all previous debate. And I invite the Minister to move amendments 11 to 14 on block. Moved. Does any member object to a single question? We put amendments 11 to 14. Thank you. If no, the question is that amendments 11 to 14 are agreed, are we all agreed? Yes. That ends consideration of the amendments and I'll have a short pause before we move on to the debate.
As members are aware, at this point in the proceedings, the presiding officer is required under standing orders to decide whether or not, in his view, any provision of the bill relates to a protected subject matter. That is, whether it modifies the electoral system and franchise for Scottish parliamentary elections. In the case of this bill, in the presiding officer's view, no provision of the damages, investment returns and periodical payment Scotland bill relates to a protected subject matter. Therefore, the bill does not require a supermajority to be passed at stage three. The next item of business is debate on motion 16394 in the name of Ash Denham on the damages, investment returns and periodical payments Scotland bill. May I ask those who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons and I call on Ash Denham to speak to and move the motion for seven minutes, please, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I'd like to start by thanking the members of the Economy, Energy and Fair Work Committee for their careful and helpful consideration of the bill. I have very much welcomed the committee's thorough scrutiny of the bill and it's clear that members of the committee have appreciated the importance of getting things right, but they've also appreciated that the process is not always straightforward. I'd like to thank the committee clerks for all their hard work and also those stakeholders who contributed views and opinions as part of the parliamentary scrutiny of the bill. The Scottish Government has had some very useful engagement with stakeholders. Um, there have at times been differing and, dare I say it, opposing views on some aspects of the provisions in the bill, perhaps not surprisingly, when there are pursuers on one side and defenders on the other. But despite their differences, a commonly held view is that the current process for setting the discount rate is flawed and the law needs to be changed in some ways to make it better. The context of the bill is therefore widely held view borne out of extensive consultation over the past seven years that the law on how the discount rate is currently set needs to be changed. And I would just like to briefly remind the Chamber about some of the key provisions in the bill and what they are intended to achieve. Part one of the bill reforms the law on the setting of the personal injury discount rate. The provisions are intended to ensure that as far as practical, the method and process for setting the discount rate is clear, certain, fair, regular, transparent and credible. The fact that there has been seven years of consultation on this matter serves only to demonstrate that this is not an easy subject and there are no easy answers. The bill provides that the job of reviewing and assessing the rate will in the first instance fall to the government actuary. On the discount rate, we have adopted an approach which regards the termination of the rate as an actuarial exercise which should be free from political interference. In any system for setting a personal injury discount rate, there must be an element of political judgment. And the approach taken in the bill is to separate out the actuarial exercise from the political judgments, with the latter being set out transparently in the legislation. The scrutiny process for this bill has provided the necessary parliamentary accountability to ensure that we have a framework which is fit for purpose. And it will be for the government actually to apply the methodology to arrive at the rate. And we are of the view that this professionalism and expertise makes him the best fit for that role. The bill also establishes a timeline for the review of the discount rate, and that's important because we are aware of the impact of a change not being made for over 15 years, and that was considerable. When the bill was introduced, it provided for reviews every three years, but we listened to stakeholders and the committee on this point and amended the bill at stage two to increase the frequency from every three years to every five years, on the basis that the committee considered that this would represent a good balance between flexibility and certainty. One of the most complex aspects of the bill is the methodology for calculating the discount rate, and the bill provides a framework for doing this. It's important to remember that at the heart of this bill are those who have suffered a significant, if not a catastrophic and life-changing injury and their right to fair and full compensation. An award for damages is designed to compensate a wrongly injured person for the losses and harm caused by injury, no more and no less. Easy to say, but hard to do. The most likely cause of someone's damages not being enough or being too much 
stand separately from the calculations around the discount rate, and that is the assessment of their life expectancy. And there are no absolutes. We can only improve or diminish the chances of over or under compensation happening. So when I talk about a framework, that terminology is important. The composition of the portfolio, the standard adjustments, and the assumption about the duration of the award are fully integrated and operate together to produce the discount rate. They're a package. For example, a riskier portfolio would attract a different adjustment for tax and investment management costs. Finally, the courts in Scotland will now have the ability to impose an order for periodical payments as provided for in part two of the bill. And it is worth noting that the intention behind the provisions in the bill, which requires a court to consider whether an award should take the form of an order for periodical payments and to make such an order without the consent of the parties, is effectively to address the current scenario, which has sometimes been described as the defender holding the trump card, because at the moment they can effectively overrule the pursuer by simply not agreeing to their preferred method of award. And I'm sure that we would all agree that there are good reasons for remedying this position. Where there is disagreement, it's considered that the best independent arbiter is the court and not effectively one or other of the parties involved. I'm convinced that the provisions in this bill will result in methods and processes which are clear, certain, fair, regular, transparent and credible. And so, presiding officer, I move that the Parliament agrees that the damages, investment returns and periodical payments of Scotland Bill be passed. I now call on Gordon Lindhurst for around six minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Let me also begin by thanking my colleagues on the Economy, Energy and Fair Work Committee for their work on this bill. And indeed also may I thank the Minister for her work on the bill, including her timely response to the Committee's Stage 1 report. And uh, not least, uh, certainly, also my thanks to the clerks and legislation team who have assisted myself and all members involved at all stages of this bill. Throughout our consideration of this bill, I think there has been a genuine recognition by everyone for a number of principles. First, the importance of the proposed legislation, which adds clarity and transparency by providing a statutory framework for calculating the personal injury discount rate. Clarity and transparency is, of course, hugely important to a person who has undergone life-changing events. A number of colleagues during the Stage 1 debate laid this out unambiguously when they described how a person's life may never be the same again following a life-changing incident, potentially unable to earn and reliant on care for the rest of their life. So though they may be few in number, cases involving the discount rate for future losses will benefit from this bill. Secondly, the principle of 100% compensation and the overarching goal of working out a system that would limit under or over compensation as much as possible. Recognizing, of course, that there can be no exact science in this, as the ministers already said, but at the same time acknowledging the effects of not getting it right for both pursuer and defender. Defenders include, of course, not just insurers to whom we might have to pay higher premiums, but also the public bodies that we fund as taxpayers, such as the NHS, who, as we heard during stage one, could be at risk in both over and under compensation scenarios. Broadly speaking, this bill has tried to hit the right balance and hopefully has been largely successful in doing so. Some of the concerns the committee had at stage one have been ironed out during subsequent stages of the bill. During stage one and in my role as convener of the committee, I raised the concerns of members in our report about gaming, a term relating to cases where a settlement might be delayed if one or more party anticipates a more favorable rate coming into force. It was therefore welcome that the minister changed the review period of the discount rate to five years. Keeping up to date with market changes is essential in ensuring that this legislation stays relevant unlike the current process for setting the discount rate, which in 2017 held a review which was the first in 15 years. A number of members across the chamber also raised the importance of the pursuer's views in determining periodical payment orders or lump sum awards. PPOs can be preferable for some people because they give certainty of a regular income over time. 
Others prefer the lump sum in order to pay for accommodation from the outset, for example. Amendment 1 sets a slightly different tone from amendments at stage 2, asking that the court has special regard to the pursuer's needs and preferences, rather than a presumption in favour of the pursuer's preferences. As the minister herself said in responding to the committee at stage one, it is important not to undermine or limit the court's ability to make the best decision given all the facts and circumstances of a particular case. The amendment should not prevent the court making that decision, but I would welcome some further comment from the minister on how she envisages a court approaching the matter. Concerns remain about amendment nine as uh, outlined by my colleague, Dean Lockhart. The goal of the bill is to stick to the 100% compensation principle as far as possible. Witnesses at stage one told the committee that the award of damages is not an investment pot. It is not a reward. It is a sum of damages to look after somebody's needs for the rest of their life. So there is a risk that this amendment takes us over the 100% principle and could have significant knock-on effects for insurance premiums and public bodies. The committee was content with the half percent standard adjustments as it appeared the minister was at that stage at least. And while this is only a small change on the face of it, in practical terms it could make a huge difference. This late change by the government will need to be carefully reviewed as appropriate as we go forward and measures taken by the Scottish ministers by way of regulation where appropriate. Uh, and with that, Deputy Presiding Officer, I conclude my comments on this bill. Now call Daniel Johnson for around five minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And let me too begin by thanking both the clerks and members of the Economy, Energy and Fair Work Committee for their excellent work on uh, this bill. Indeed, uh, speaking in this bill, I, I feel is something of a, an interloper, um, given the, the uh, substantial work and very difficult subject matter that they've uh, been dealing with. Uh, could I also acknowledge uh, and give my thanks to the many organisations and individuals who've participated in the drafting and consultation process, and undoubtedly their work has meant that we have a stronger bill in front of us. Uh, Labour supports this bill and welcomes its aim of creating a fair, transparent and credible uh, personal injury uh, discount rate and damages regime. This bill seeks ultimately to protect people who have both suffered significantly and in many cases will undoubtedly be vulnerable and to provide them with greater clarity, transparency and security uh, for those who have been injured through uh, wrongful behaviour. And ultimately, it is about making sure that we have a, a damages system in place that is fair and equitable. It's about creating a system that empowers those seeking compensation rather than taking away more of their control. And I think as the Minister very correctly uh, set out uh, in her opening remarks, there are no easy answers. This bill is a, a series of balances that have been struck. And I think through the consideration both at stages one and two, I think most of those uh, balances have been struck well. But let me just address uh, some of the amendments which have uh, gone through. This bill undoubtedly represents progress. And as I've said, that there is a debate about where those balances have been struck, which is why in Amendment 1, um, we were very pleased uh, to have seen uh, progress. Amendment 1 will ensure that the court awarding damages will, have be, uh, will, will have be required to have special regard to pursuers' needs and preferences, deciding whether to impose a periodical payment order. And as we've already heard from speakers in, in this debate, there is a balance there to be struck between the preferences of the individual and the ability of the court to decide uh, what is the, the, the best outcome given all the facts in front of us. But I think this amendment does strike that balance and I think uh, the bill is stronger for it. It's an important change. It will provide greater security and protection and reassurance to those pursuing damages through the courts. I'd also like to turn to Amendment 9. And, and throughout the passage of this bill, Labour has put forward uh, arguments uh, about how we can make it fairer for, for pursuers. And while we welcome uh, the areas where the government has done likewise, we do obviously have concerns about Amendment 9 and feel it could have gone further. When the bill was originally drafted, the government uh, underestimated the cost of pursuer, uh, 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 to the pursuer of inflation, taxation and investment rights. So, and as a result, uh, the, uh, we're pleased that the government has increased that level of standard adjustment from 0.5 to 0.7 of a percentage point to take into account the impact of taxation and the costs 
of investment advice and management. And I think that is advice and uh, support that people will need because they, are fa they will undoubtedly be facing decisions that they have never had to make before, speaking to professionals that they will not regularly or normally have contact with. So it's important um, that they are provided uh, that level of support. And it is, but it's, uh, as I said, disappointing that the government uh, chose to set a rate at the lower end of the range of, of actuaries and lower than I think um, uh, many would have wanted. So while we support Amendment 9, I think it is important that that is kept uh, under review. And I uh, welcome the, the Minister's uh, remarks she made in the debating of that amendment uh, on that very point. In conclusion, this bill is an important step forward in providing security to those who have suffered what will very often be traumatic and indeed life-altering events. There is, of course, more that could have been done to provide greater protection to the most vulnerable people who find themselves seeking damage, but this is an important step forward. We would urge the government, therefore, to keep these measures under review and be willing to revise and reform the provisions of this bill once enacted, not least with regard to the standard adjustments, as I have already outlined. So Labour supports this bill as it will help protect vulnerable people, those who have been injured. Um, and while recognising its uh, uh, flaws, we welcome the passage of this legislation and the fact that it will create a fairer, more transparent, more credible regime regarding personal injury uh, and, and damages awards. Thank you very much. Call Liam MacArthur for around four minutes, please. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, and uh, welcome the opportunity to make a few brief remarks. A little like uh, Daniel Johnson, I feel a bit of an interloper uh, in this debate uh, as well, but can I, um, like others, pay tribute to the work of the Economy Committee and its clerks um, for all they've done on what is a, a, a technical bill, um, but one that is um, hugely important, particularly to those who find themselves having to make a compensation claim often vulnerable, probably, possibly at a, a low point in their life. And I think the committee uh, were absolutely right at stage one to observe that the number of people affected by personal injury cases uh, where the discount rate applies may be small, but the means of calculating their compensation is of vast importance to them and their families, as well as to pursue and defend their interests, the NHS included, and the insurance industry. I think that encapsulates what we are trying to wrestle with uh, here. I, as I observed during the earlier uh, proceedings, um, I've had some uh, engagement with these issues through the work the Justice Committee did uh, on the Civil Litigation uh, Act. And I think very much at the forefront of our thoughts um, during that process were the, the points made by, by Gordon Lindhurst and Daniel Johnson about the importance of clarity uh, and um, transparency. Transparency, they're absolutely key. There is a need to try and avoid uh, the risk of uh, undercompensation or indeed overcompensation. I think, again, as the, the committee observed, this is not an exact science. Uh, it's a balance uh, to be struck. I think I'd make maybe a couple of observations, again, following on from the exchanges during the amendments earlier. Uh, I'm very grateful to Jackie Bailey for setting out the background to her amendment. I, I realise that that has been a, an iterative process. I'm grateful too to John Mason uh, for his observations on that point, because as, as I said, during the civil litigation uh, bill scrutiny, process, we were, um, I think, concerned at instances where lump sums were being uh, awarded um, and, and possibly then not necessarily being used in the best interest of the individual uh, concerned. Uh, there was also the risk uh, of uh, some of that lump sum then being uh, assigned to uh, legal representatives uh, as well. And again, uh, the issue of um, the, the, the compensation needed to manage the cost through the lifetime, over a lifetime, uh, were very much at the um, the, uh, the heart of what we were seeking to achieve. I think the balance has been struck through the amendment uh, that Jackie Bailey has uh, seen passed to make sure that the pursuer's um, uh, needs, interests uh, and, uh, and wishes are properly respected and reflected in any judgment that the uh, court comes to as a, as a result of that uh, process. The, the other concern was uh, obviously in relation to uh, Amendment uh, 9. Uh, I, again, I won't necessarily rehearse all that, but uh, I, I was slightly concerned that uh, in response to the, answer, to, to the parliamentary question uh, from Alex Cole Hamilton uh, recently, that the, the minister had set out, and as I, I think it bears repeating, that the Scottish Government expects that the, Scottish, the UK Government will continue to cover the costs arising from the change in the discount rate to the extent that the rate in Scotland is in line with the rate in England and Wales. The Scottish Government will continue to pass this funding on to NHS in Scotland. Um, 
However, I think where those um, rates diverge, it's not entirely clear to, to me um, how that shortfall will be made up. And while I know that the Minister is acting on actuarial uh, advice, I'd be interested to know what conversations have indeed taken place with uh, health uh, colleagues. Uh, again, um, it would be interesting to know why an updated financial memorandum was not published ahead of stage three. But I recognise there's an opportunity to review this process. Uh, there are colleagues who wish to see the, uh, the, the rate uh, somewhat higher than um, what the uh, Minister has proposed. Uh, others who have concerns that it, um, it has increased from uh, stage one. Uh, again, I think there's a balance to be struck here. It's impossible necessarily to, to get it absolutely right in every uh, instance. But I think there are concerns about uh, the process leading up uh, to this uh, point. In conclusion, though, this bill is very welcome. Uh, like the Civil Litigation uh, Act, it appears to strike the best balance, ensuring those pursuing personal injury cases have the clarity, the transparency and the security uh, they need uh, and that it has fairness very much at the heart of it. And on that basis, Scottish Liberal Democrats will be supporting it at decision time. Thank you. We now move to the open debate and speeches of around four minutes, please. John Mason, followed by Jamie Halcrow Johnson. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. I very much welcome the fact that this bill has got to stage three today. It seems we have not had uh, too many major disputes over amendments this afternoon. A lot of this bill is about trying to get the balance right between pursuers and defenders. We're not wanting to overcompensate or to undercompensate. However, it is frankly not possible to get every case exactly 100% compensated. In fact, it can be argued that every case is inevitably either over or undercompensated. So we then have the question, is it acceptable to have 50% of people over and 50% of people undercompensated? Clearly, the government feeling is that that is not an acceptable position and we, sh we should reduce the numbers who are undercompensated, and I tend to agree with that. Two contentious issues have been the further margin adjustment and the adjustment to cover tax and financial advice. The reality is that the committee had conflicting evidence on both of these. On the further margin adjustment, the proposal has been 0.5%. ABI and others have argued fairly persistently for a reduction of that to 0.25%. While we also heard arguments for an increase uh, as even 0.5% would still leave substantial numbers undercompensated if they live longer, for example, or inflation is higher. On balance, I feel that 0.5% is reasonable and gets the balance about right. The one where the government has moved is for tax and financial advice. Again, the committee found it difficult to pin down witnesses, but there was a general feeling that 0.5% may not be sufficient. I think we particularly felt that at the start of the process, immediately after a lump sum had been awarded, most recipients would be seriously beyond their comfort zone and would need substantial amounts of advice at that point. So I have to say I'm comfortable that the government has moved to 0.5% on this. As Ash Denham said, she has acted on the most up-to-date advice. Now, Gordon Lindhurst said that there was a risk of over 100% compensation, eh, but at the same time, some inevitably will be getting less than 100%, eh, just fewer of them. And Labour and Daniel Johnson said the opposite effectively, which was that they feel we should have gone further. However, there does seem to be a lack of information on what pursuers actually do with a lump sum. And I just wonder if maybe this is something that going forward needs to be looked at and studied more. I suppose part of me does wonder how many of these figures should be in primary legislation, which is more difficult to change, and how many could have been in regulations. However, we are at stage three now, so it's a bit late in the day to change that. Another issue has been exactly where periodical payment orders sit in the scheme of things. They do seem an attractive option to many of us, as they considerably reduce the risk which a pursuer is subject to, for example, again, inflation or life expectancy. However, we did hear evidence that some victims would be against PPOs, perhaps because they do not trust the defender to actually pay, or because they do not uh, want any kind of ongoing relationship with the defender. While not trying to tie the hands of the courts, I also think many of us did not feel it would do any harm to give the courts a strong indication, as the amendment has done, uh, of Parliament's thinking on this point. That is, that they should take very seriously the pursuer's wishes. 
So we get to stage three today with a bill that greatly modernises the previous system, even though witnesses did not agree on their detailed evidence. I think they did agree that this was a step in the right direction and we should actually be legislating on this matter. In particular, the idea that investors would put all their money into gilts, which traditionally have, have been the safer thing to do, has increasingly seemed unlikely in practice. It is good that the government has engaged on points that the committee had concerns about, and we've been able to reach a fair degree of consensus today. I do not think the Economy Committee actually deals with very much legislation, but I think we have given this bill a very thorough and fair scrutiny, and I'm sure we'll be open to handling more legislation in the future. Thank you. Jamie Halcrow Johnson, followed by Jackie Bailey. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. I welcome the opportunity to speak in this final stage of the bill. As members will be aware, I've been involved with the le legislation through each of its stages, speaking at stage one, being involved through committee at stage two, and now speaking today. The principles around the bill have remained constant. That is, if it is right to make provision to compensate in full those who have suffered injuries, while recognizing that overcompensation brings its own problems. There has been a long wait for a fairer method of setting the discount rate for personal injury cases. Prior to the bill being brought, it had simply not been reviewed for an extended amount of time. As a consequence, these changes that we are, now, uh, that we are seeing now are significant. When I spoke in the stage one debate, I highlighted the importance of the subject that we are dealing with, and it bears some brief repetition. While a lot of it seems technical, ultimately the rules that we are laying out ensure that individuals, many of whom have been grievously wronged, are compensated. That compensation can mean vital support needed to lead a full life uh, is in place or save a person from the extensive additional costs that their injuries may occur, incur. As the bill has progressed, there have been several positives. The amendments at stage two have been broadly welcome. They have now created a better bill. The extension of the review cycle from three years to five years is certainly an improvement. This mitigates a number of the concerns about gaming the system, as has been mentioned, that had existed and threatened to drag legal action um, out further, creating problems not only for the defender, but for the courts too. Setting a requirement to consult ahead of reviews of the dis discount rate, recognizing the need to consider changed approaches, will improve these reviews and make them more worthwhile exercises. Here at stage three, there are a number of amendments that are technical. I'll not dwell long on these, but the main government amendment of substance, however, is the change to the adjustment for investment charges and taxation contained in Amendment 9, raising it from 0.25% to 0.75%. The Minister will be aware that in our Stage 1 report, the Economy, uh, Energy and Fair Work Committee outlined that it was content with the approach previously presented in the bill when it came to the two standard adjustments. This new change is not a minor one, nor do we have a full sense of the cost, both to businesses and the public sector, of making it. When I submitted a written question to ministers last year, it seemed that they did not have the full picture of the cost of damages claims of this nature to the public purse. In terms of its impact on local authorities, for example, we seem to have drawn a blank. Much of the discussion around the bill was based on the previous 0.5 adjustment, <coughs> and as we might expect, that was the basis of the evidence that was taken by the committee. So it's disappointing that this amendment is being brought in this way and at this time. On periodical payments, Amendment 1 by Jackie Bailey is the key change in this area that is being proposed. I've heard the discussion at Stage 2 and appreciate that, uh, that what we are now presented with is quite different from earlier amendments. This amendment proposes that special regard be given to the pursuer's wishes when a court is considering its approach to a PPO. Ultimately, this leaves the decision to the court to apply in individual circumstances. We heard evidence before the committee that pursuers may be concerned at being seen to be forced into future relationships with the defender through the PPO. Ultimately, this ought to remain a decision for the courts in light of individual circumstances. But this amendment provides additional scope for the pursuer to be at the heart of the decision-making process. Deputy Presiding Officer, the bill is worth supporting. In many ways, it is overdue. And I appreciate that ministers have taken some cognizance of the committee's recommendations and the issues that have been raised here in the chamber. That being said, there remain some concerns, I think legitimate ones, about how the changes will operate in practice, particularly with the substantive issue of the standard adjustment that I've spoken about. Questions do remain. Jackie Bailey, followed by Angela Constance. Presiding officer, I'm grateful for the opportunity to contribute to this final stage three debate on the damages, investment returns and periodical payments Scotland bill. 
Um, let me also congratulate the Bill team, the Minister, the clerks to the committee, um, thank them and indeed thank the Association of Personal Injury Lawyers for their assistance in considering this bill. Um, I think this is the Minister's second bill taken through Parliament. It's an achievement of which she should feel proud. Some may regard this as a very dry technical bill, but you know it can have a profound effect on those having to seek compensation. That said, I hope that the provisions of this bill will not apply to many people, because we are, of course, talking about people who will have experienced catastrophic and life-changing events. It is clearly desirable that few people experience such trauma and its consequences. But the bill does an important job in focusing on dealing with compensation, how it's calculated and how it's paid. During the committee evidence stage, it was clear that whilst pursuers and defenders may have very different views on whether there was likely to be over or under compensation, there was agreement about the need for fairness and clarity. The Scottish Government is clear in their policy intention to achieve 100% compensation for people to whom a personal injury award is made. And I think we all agree with that objective. Those responsible for paying out compensation, the defenders, believe that the government is being over generous and their assumptions about investment are far too cautious. So for example, they suggest that investors will invest in equities and not just fixed assets on which there is a lower return. Those of course who represent pursuers believe that any notional portfolio of investment should be on a no risk basis and they believe that there may be a danger of undercompensation. Having listened to the evidence, I think the Scottish Government's approach is right. While it is not a no risk, it is a low risk and strikes an appropriate balance between the defender and pursuer interests. At the end of the day, most people with a personal injury award will not have considered an investment portfolio before. They are likely, as most of us um, would do, to err on the side of caution. Where I think there may still be a need for further work is around the standard adjustment for financial advice and tax. Um, but I recognise that we've pushed the government um, further than they were originally comfortable with. And as I said in the earlier debate on Amendment 9, I welcome the movement from the Minister to a rate of 0.75%. It's an increase of a quarter of a percent on the previous figure, but I will take that anyway. I know the standard adjustment in this area um, is under consideration by colleagues south of the border the UK government indeed, and the Ministry of Justice. So I am just ever so slightly bemused at the Scottish Tories arguing against the position of the UK Tories until clearly somebody phoned the front bench and they all decided to abstain and said. But there you go. But there is no doubt that I think this is a step in the right direction. Um, but when you consider the evidence that the committee heard, I think we should acknowledge that it may not be enough. A range of very reputable financial advisors, expert in personal damages, pointed to a much higher level of cost for tax and advice. I'm not going to rehearse the arguments again, other than to say that even the government actually suggested a range of costs, yes, at the lower end of 0.5%, but up to 2%. And therefore, I would ask that the Minister ensures that this is kept under close review and the figure adjusted with experience should that become necessary. Finally, Presiding Officer, I want to touch very briefly on periodical payment orders and I welcome the Government's support for my amendment. This was something that I had pursued and indeed Angela Constance had pursued in both the committee and during the stage one debate in the chamber. And it recognises quite simply that at the end of a lengthy and often distressing court process, that the views of the pursuer are given due consideration by the judge before deciding on whether to make the award as a periodical payment or as a lump sum. Overall, presiding officer, I hope the bill will make a positive difference to the experience of people that have pursued a claim for personal injury, and I am therefore pleased to support the bill at decision time this evening. The last of the open debate contributions is from Angela Constance. Thank you, presiding officer. It has been repeated throughout the parliamentary process for this bill that while the number of people directly affected and indeed the number of people who will be affected as Jackie Bailey says is, is hopefully small uh, it is nonetheless uh, crucial legislation uh, that the minister has brought before us 
And as I said during the stage one debate, uh, this legislation is crucial to those who have suffered the consequences of, say, an accident at work or a birth that did not go to plan or a, a lack of care or negligence by an individual or an organisation, meaning that an individual lives with the tragedy of no longer being who they were meant to be, nor leading the life that they have worked for uh, or indeed uh, dreamed of. And as Liam MacArthur, I think, uh, also pointed out, uh, while this is quite a discreet uh, bill, it is part of a, a wider package uh, of reform also. And the time that I have available to me, President Officer, I uh, principally uh, want to focus on periodical uh, payment orders. And as we know, the committee heard a substantial uh, amount of evidence uh, about the risks that victims of personal injury bear uh, with compensation, particularly if it's received in a lump sum. And no matter how good the legislation is at calculating an award for damages, particularly for future loss, and of course we can be confident that the legislation uh, before us is much improved, uh, it was good to begin with, but it's improved as a result of stage two and stage three, it is fair to say, as John Mason has said often, that it is not an exact science and never will be. So the risk of undercompensation can be minimised, but it can never be removed entirely. And it is uh, important to remember that damages are not surplus funds. They are meant to replace loss of earnings and future care costs. And Professor Vass um, gave very powerful evidence when she advised Committee of Inflation Bust and Care Costs uh, the unpredictability of life expectancy uh, and, of course, the costs uh, in and around specialised services and accommodation. And, of course, all of this points to the advantages uh, of a periodical uh, payment order. And the bill uh, will, for the first time, give the courts the power to impose periodical payments, but, crucially, where the continuity of payments is secure. However, the committee also heard uh, and evidence from Patrick Maguire, from Thompson Solicitors and others who express concern uh, about a victim potentially being forced to accept uh, a PPO and how disempowering that could be for someone who has already suffered a catastrophic injury and had to endure uh, a somewhat lengthy court process. And the Minister herself uh, acknowledged that for some pursuers, they will indeed want a clean break uh, from, from those responsible for their injury. And I think Jackie Bailey rightly pointed out that we will in the future see you know, a combination um, of PPOs you know, along with uh, a smaller uh, lump sum. So the committee recommended that the government uh, bring forward amendments to give more weight to the views of the injured person. And the minister during uh, stage one gave a very clear commitment to take matters forward. And I am pleased that she has uh, done that in collaboration with other members and in particular uh, Jackie uh, Bailey. And it is very apt uh, that this matter was addressed uh, in the very first and sus subsequent amendment in today's uh, stage three proceedings. And I think the wording uh, to have special regard uh, to the pursuer's needs uh, is particularly apt and somewhat poignant um, in, in this regard. So uh, I welcome the fact that the Minister found a way forward to ensure that the, the voice of those who have suffered injury and their preferences is listened to, that it's given uh, appropriate weight and that we therefore are not adding to that feeling of powerlessness that is all too frequent in the lives of those with significant disabilities, illness or injury. And the objective of this bill, as the Minister highlighted earlier, was to be clear, was to be transparent and was to be fair. And in my view, uh, the bill meets those objectives and I want to congratulate the Minister uh, and her bill team. Thank you. We move to the closing speeches and I call Daniel Johnson for around four minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'll, I'll try very hard not to repeat any of the arguments as I've, uh, I've already laid out, but let me just touch on some of the points which I think have been quite usefully made through debate. And I'd like to begin with John Mason. And again, I think he set out a, a, a quite a good analysis at the beginning of his remarks, so really asking the question of what we want to achieve. And I think there, is, there, are, there are two approaches of trying to get it right every time, which is an impossibility. Um, or do you want to minimise the situations where you have undercompensation? And ultimately, that is the approach 
that the government's taken, and it is undoubtedly, I think, the, the right approach. That if we seek to simply average off, there are going to be individuals who, through no fault of the, their own, will be disadvantaged, and we must have a regime that seeks to avoid that. Now, and I think the very fact that, that we have some defenders or those who are representing defenders saying that the government has been over generous is possibly, and dare I say, a good sign. Um, uh, and, and, I, and I think that because we, we cannot have a system whereby simply the net result is right, it has to be a system where actually we get it right more often than we uh, do not. And, and, we ha and uh, which is why throughout this, uh, the passage of this bill, I've asked the question of not just asking about what a reasonable person might do, but what, what might the more vulnerable person do under these circumstances. And I think the most relevant question, I think, that John Mason posed was, what do pursuers actually do with money? What actually happens? And we don't know. And I think that is something that will have to be monitored and reviewed, because I don't think we can expect, as Jackie Bailey pointed out, that those who are awarded damages to suddenly become investment experts and always make the right investment uh, decisions. And ultimately, this is a, a, a bill which is a series of balances. And I think that is most uh, the, possibly the most important one. We must continue to view these people as uh, vulnerable people. They, they cannot be expected to be, become an investment uh, experts overnight, and which is why I think you know, it's uh, perhaps no surprise that Amendment 9 was a matter of uh, some debate, but it is important it's kept under review. I would also just like to address the points around public bodies and what happens in the case of under and over investment, because ultimately it's our public bodies which are the ultimate guarantor, and in both situations. And yes, we do have to be concerned about the situation where there is possibly overcompensation, where uh, bodies such as the NHS or other public bodies might have to fork out higher bills. But the risk of undercompensation is that those self-same bodies will then have to meet the needs of those people who are undercompensated. That the shortfall that, that might arise or could arise if they are, those people are undercompensated would be met by social services and health services having to support that person because they don't have enough money from the damages award. So the balance is on both sides and it is far from, from one-sided. I think that the, 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 another point I'd uh, just like to raise, I think, is the, the point around interactions, which I think uh, Liam MacArthur, I think, rightly highlighted. And two key interactions. Obviously, we, we do have to be mindful of changes uh, being made uh, by the UK government. And indeed, perhaps even the, the front bench need to be mindful of uh, changes being made by the UK government too, and the, the amendments they, they seek to support or otherwise. Um, but also, I think the civil litigation bill and this bill will clearly uh, work to a degree in, in, in consort. They, will both, they both look at how uh, private individuals can seek um, uh, redress through the courts uh, for situations which are not their fault but are clearly going to have significant impacts on them. What we can't do is have another regime, and indeed as the, as the last one turned out to be, where, where the world moves on and the, the legislation is unable to keep up. This is a bill which clearly has the ability to have that flexibility uh, and keep up uh, with the five-year reviews, which is, is a welcome uh, point. But obviously, we need to make sure that all aspects of this, including all the calculations of discounts, are reviewed because the world does move on. And I just finally, I think, reflect on a, 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 I think the remark that, you know, obviously where those uh, discounts are baked onto the face of the legislation, that will require a, a, a more careful consideration about how they are updated. But ultimately, um, this is a, a bill that will help those which who have been uh, suffered a great deal of loss and hopefully will be of a great deal of help to those um, pursuing compensation through the courts. Thank you very much. Call Dean Lockhart for five minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I'm very pleased to contribute to this afternoon's debate on stage three of the damages, investment returns and periodic payments at Scotland Bill. I thank those who provided submissions to the Economy Committee, the witnesses who attended and the constructive approach taken by members of the committee and by the Minister and her team. As other members have said, while the bill is technical in nature, it's also very important. It provides for a new statutory regime to calculate the personal injury discount rate that applies to compensation awards in personal injury cases. And the Scottish Conservatives welcome the passage of the bill. As Angela Constance said, although the discount rate will only apply in a relatively small number of cases, the impact for the individual and the families concerned is life-changing and it's to be welcomed uh, the additional transparency and clarity provided by the legislation. Under Scots law, the role of compensation is to restore the injured party to the extent 
that a financial award can as closely as possible to the position they were in before the injury. And when assessing the amount of a lump sum award, courts take into account the net rate of investment return that the injured person might expect to receive from a reasonably prudent investment of that lump sum. This is what we have been referring to as the discount rate, and as I think pretty much every member has said, it is not always a science. Despite having some reservations in relation to the investment charges adjustment, which was the basis of our discussion over Amendment 9 earlier, the Scottish Conservatives will be supporting the bill at decision time this evening. Presenting officer, before the introduction of the bill, there was general consensus among defender and pursuer groups on the need to update the system, the need to increase the availability of periodic payment uh, orders, and to give courts further powers to introduce uh, periodic payment orders, and also the need for regular reviews of the discount rate. And I'm pleased to say that after stages one and two revisions, the bill now deals with those issues. We're pleased that the Minister brought forward amendments at stage two to change the review cycle for the notional portfolio to every five years instead of three years. It's also important that in changing to a five-year uh, cycle, uh, the, the, the Scottish Government recognised the nature of fast-moving investment markets and changes to investment practice within that period and therefore introduced a formal duty to consult stakeholders as part of that review cycle. And I'm grateful to the Minister for supporting my amendment to this effect. It has the advantage of making the legislation clearer and more transparent, which was one of the objectives of the Bill. Turning to the notional portfolio set out in the Bill, there are still some concerns that the notional portfolio is too cautious. It's uh, too highly invested in fixed assets which offer a lower return than investments in equities. Likewise, some stakeholders still believe the Scottish Government is being cautious in its approach to having a 0.75% standard adjustment for investment charges and taxation. And I think, look, at, we, we've heard the arguments before with regard to that, but I think that has to be seen in the context of there also being the further margin adjustment of 0.5%, which acts as an additional buffer to avoid undercompensation. However, uh, we understand uh, the government's approach to legislating in favour of a risk of overcompensation rather than undercompensation, but as I mentioned earlier, we have to recognise this comes at a cost. And I think some of the members, Liam MacArthur and others, have uh, explored uh, what the implications of what those costs uh, might be to the National Health Service in Scotland and other bodies that self-insure. It could also be borne by small businesses where claims exceed their insurance limit uh, of indemnity. <clears throat> Going forward, it will be important for the Scottish <coughs> Government to assess the operation of the bill and to continuously assess uh, the change to the standard adjustment and other uh, mechanics of the bill to make sure uh, the bill and those changes don't have unintended consequences. Uh, Presiding officer, the Scottish Conservatives will be voting for the bill at decision time this evening. We welcome many aspects of this bill and we hope it will work in the interests of all stakeholders. Thank you. I now call Ash Denham to close the debate and around six minutes will take us to decision time, please, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I'd like to thank those members who have uh, contributed to this afternoon's debate. And I'd like to just take a moment to address some of the points that have been raised during the course of the debate. Uh, Gordon Linters, uh, he's uh, raised the point about more detail on what uh, special regard would mean um, for the courts in practice. But of course, it will be for the courts to interpret and to apply that provision um, in the circumstances of that particular case. Um, it's not really appropriate for us to go too far in speculating as to how that provision will be applied in practice, and I hope that re reassures the member on that point. Um, a point was raised by both um, Gordon Lindhurst again and also uh, Liam MacArthur on um, the difference between Scotland and England and Wales and what effect that might have on funding for the NHS. So until the respective reviews are completed, we won't know if there will be different rates or not. And the financial memorandum, which was specifically mentioned by Liam MacArthur, sets out the position as clearly as we can at the moment. And remember too that the impact of the discount rate can of course be mitigated by the use of periodical payments and the provisions in the bill which relate to PPOs would be helpful to bodies such as the NHS who would of course be deemed as a secure funder. 
Uh, Daniel Johnson and Jackie ba Bailey also um, made mention of Amendment 9 in their contributions. And uh, just to reiterate that obviously that was um, the result of advice um, given to uh, the Scottish Government on analysis by GAD based on the most recent and up-to-date um, evidence that was available. And it will obviously be subject to review ahead of each regular rate review and it can be adjusted by regulations, just to uh, reassure Daniel Johnson on that point, if the evidence points to the need to do so. So the legislation is, in a, in a sense, future-proofed in that way because it's able to be updated by regulation. Um, John Mason, in his um, contribution, also made comments on Amendment 9 as well, and I note his comments on that. And I would also welcome his general comment um, on the modernising effect of the bill. And finally, um, I'd just like to make mention of Angela Constance, um, in her contribution, she reminded us of the crucial fact that damages are not surplus funds, and I think that's uh, a point well made. The bill may seem dry and technical, but often it is a detailed and considered approach that is precisely what is needed to address the complexities and challenges which arise when developing a broad solution for what are all individual and unique cases. Whilst fair and full compensation is at the heart, Nevertheless, the bill aims to strike a balance, remembering that overcompensation is to the detriment of the defender or their insurer, and ultimately it is the general public who would pay either through funding or public services such as the NHS or paying more for their insurance premiums if the balance is tipped too far. Equally, where a pursuer's funds run out sooner than anticipated, they will usually have to fall back on the state for their care and possibly other needs. Again, a point raised by Daniel Johnson in his contribution. And I hope it's clear that we have listened carefully to what has been said by stakeholders and by the committee and other MSPs during stages both one and two. And I've been pleased to support the amendments made by the committee at stage two, and we've agreed some minor amendments to these today to ensure that they work as intended. We know that there are many reasons a pursuer may not want to have any part of their damages paid through a periodical payments. These might be very practical, for example, if there is an element of contributory negligence involved, and therefore the damages award has been accordingly reduced. It may be that the investment of a lump sum is the most viable way of making up any shortfall, even if there are risks associated with this strategy. And members spoke very eloquently about the powerlessness a pursuer might feel should a PPO be imposed against their wishes, and I have sympathy with that prospect. And so I was very happy to meet with Jackie Bailey on that point to discuss the issues and see if we could reach an accommodation on what would be an appropriate amendment to the bill, bearing in mind that there were legal constraints around what could be done. And I think that Jackie Bailey has got the right balance um, in her amendment in that regard. I also think that the bill overall has picked a very careful path through the competing demands of both pursuer and defender interests. It was defender interests supported by the committee in their stage one report who pressed for change in the frequency of review from three years to five years. I also tabled some amendments of a minor nature here today which respond to the points from the Association of British Insurers scrutiny of the bill. And equally, I was pleased to bring forward amendments agreed to at stage two, which ensure that where proceedings to vary an order for periodical payments are raised, the pursuer should continue to receive the protection of qualified one-way cost shifting, as that is in the spirit of the legislation as it relates to personal injury actions. The amendment debated earlier, which increased the standard adjustment for tax and investment management costs, is one that simply preserves the interdependencies and therefore the integrity of the methodology for reaching a new rate and ensures that it remains robust and fit for purpose. And on that note, I think it'd be helpful to focus on one of those provisions in particular. And I'd like to talk about the hypothetical investor because this is the constant in the bill. And any changes to the investment portfolio, whether they be of the asset type or their percentage allocation can only be made where the end result is that the notional portfolio remains suitable for investment in by the hypothetical investor. The characteristics of the hypothetical investor have been very carefully formulated to capture the likely investment objectives of a pursuer. <laughs> Importantly, the bill has also been future-proofed so that Scottish ministers have the tools and the flexibility to ensure that all of the components necessary to arrive at a rate or rates can be kept up to date. 
This will allow ministers to ensure that the legislative framework for setting the rate remains appropriate. And finally, I'd like to repeat my thanks to all those who gave evidence to help improve the bill during its parliamentary process. And I commend the motion in my name, presiding officer. Thank you very much. And that concludes uh, stage three proceedings on the damages, investment returns and periodical payments Scotland bill. And we'll move on shortly to decision time. Thank you very much. We come to decision time and there's only one question this afternoon. The question is that motion 16394 in the name of Ash Denham on the damages, investment returns and periodical payments Scotland bill be agreed. And because this is a stage three, I would ask members all to press their voting buttons. Members may vote now. Thank you. The result of the vote on motion 16394 in the name of Ash Denham is yes, 112. There were no votes against, there were no abstentions, the motion is agreed and the damages, investment returns and periodical payments Scotland Bill is passed. Thank you. That concludes decision time. We're going to move on shortly to a member's business debate in the name of Stuart Macmillan on Scottish Tourism Month. But we'll just take a few moments for members and the minister to change seats.